I'm going to argue that epistemic normativity is fully reducible to biological normativity. And then I'm going to explain away any dodgy intuitions that people might have which suggest that that's not true. Okay. So this is what I'm going to do. That's the thesis. Epistemic normativity is reducible to biological normativity. My account's going to explain the sense in which it's true that belief is subject to a standard of correctness and it's going to reduce epistemic norms to their immediate dosastic strategies which guide how best to meet that standard. And I'll give a debunking argument to explain away the mistakes we make in our epistemic discourse, understood as either taking epistemic properties and norms to be sui generis and irreducible, and or as failing to recognise the reductive base of epistemic norms. And this argument will appeal to the claim that the beliefs which constitute our epistemic discourse are false but reductive and are the outcome of a non-truth tracking process. Okay, so my opponents, which are many, are just people who take epistemic normativity not to be reducible to biological normativity and or to involve sui generis properties and norms governing belief. So just first some preliminaries. So some people interested in the nature of morality have been moved by considerations of metaphysical strangeness, so a conversation at least made most famous by Mackey. And some people moved by such considerations have given error accounts of our moral discourse. And Mackey at least directed his arguments towards moral properties and discourse, but thought that his conclusions generalised to, for example, the aesthetic case. So he said that there do not exist entities or relations of a certain kind, objective values or requirements, and I think that our epistemic discourse commits us to objective requirements insofar as we take epistemic reasons to be categorical reasons, and our epistemic discourse also commits us to entities which are hard to square with a naturalistic worldview. So, I'll give an account of such discourse and the properties it cites in biological terms, and the way I'm using hypothetical and categorical reason here is shorthand, so the reason itself isn't hypothetical, um, it's just grounded in the fact that there's a hypothetical imperative, and the same goes for categorical. So a categorical reason is one which is grounded in there being a categorical imperative. Okay, I also have this background assumption um, of a motivational account of belief. I'm not committed to any particular formulation, um, but I like Lucy O'Brien's formulation, which is that it's essential to believe that it by itself and relative to a fixed background of desires disposes the subject to behave in ways that would promote the satisfaction of his desires if its contents were true. So this background condition I'm just going to keep in mind for what follows because I take features of belief linking it to the truth to be um, contingent features. So what makes something a belief isn't its being truth directed or any nearby claim, but rather whether or not it plays some motivational role. So that's just um, something that's going to sit in the background. I'm also going to talk a lot about biological function. So I'm going to be ascribing biological functions to our mechanisms of belief production and arguing that these function claims can do some serious explanatory work. And I'm going to assume a historical account of function according to which, very roughly, the function of some trait is to do whatever ancestors of that trait did, which got them selected. And this has been defended by all those people in brackets. And for it to be appropriate to ascribe a historical function to our mechanisms of belief production, they need to have been selected for. So I'll just quickly give three reasons to think that this is the case. So I outline them here just to give, show the legitimacy of giving a selection to account of our mechanisms for belief production. Okay, so the first reason comes from Millikan, and it's that modern human cognition cannot fail to meet at least one of the sufficient conditions for biological function possession. So she says being built by natural selection is sufficient for proper function, being maintained by natural selection is independently sufficient for proper function, and it's hard to see how modern human cognition could fail to be caught in one or more of these nets. So the extension of the claim is that our mechanisms of belief production as a part of human cognition can equally not fail to meet one of these conditions, and so they too are functional items. Um, second reason to think that our mechanisms for belief production are selected, is that they're really biologically expensive. Um, so the long period of infant dependency required for the development of the human brain, as well as the large energy costs in running it. So the existence of these biologically expensive capacities gives us a prima facie reason for assigning a low probability to the development of such mechanisms unless they confer a decided selective advantage. Okay. And the final reason, 
is that the formation of beliefs produces changes to a creature's dispositions which alter its responses to the environment. So I think that beliefs are motivational devices and given that, the very nature of them means that adaptive pressures will be in play. And if that's right, the biological costliness that I just mentioned is going to be less important because even if the mechanisms, mechanisms which produce beliefs were really cheap to produce, it would still be a matter of huge importance that they produce beliefs appropriately. So given that they're the kind of thing which affect how a creature responds to its environment, um, they're going to be the kind of thing which are going to be sensitive to adaptive pressures. Okay, so they're supposed to kind of warm you up to the idea that it's appropriate to give a biological account of our mechanisms for belief production. So, a lot of people have said that our mechanisms for belief production have, as at least one of their biological proper functions, the production of true beliefs. I'm about to dwell in too much on the reasons in favour of that claim. We should just note that beliefs which are true are more likely to dispose a creature to act in ways which will satisfy its desires. And the claim that true beliefs are adaptive has been taken to be obvious by many philosophers. So Quine claims that creatures in better are wrong in their inductions have a pathetic but praiseworthy tendency to die before reproducing their kind. So just for the sake of exposition, I'm going to understand this function claim as one which says that the only function of our mechanisms for belief production is to produce true beliefs. That's not to say any of these people are committed to that, it's just for the sake of argument. And in this section I'll present some cases of false but useful beliefs, cases in which the mechanisms which produce these beliefs are functioning as they should. And uh, what I'm doing here is trying to warm you up to the idea of there being a biological function proper to the mechanisms which produce our beliefs, which is other than to track truth. Okay. So, merely false beliefs aren't going to present a problem for the claim that our mechanisms for belief production have as their only biological function the production of true beliefs. And that's because claiming a function for a set of cognitive mechanisms says nothing about how often or even if that function is going to be performed. So again, Millikan says, a description of the biological functions of the cognitive system will in no way resemble a catalogue of psychological laws. It's certainly no psychological law, for example, that our beliefs are true, though it is a teleofunction of our belief fixing systems to fix true beliefs. So functions can fail to be performed, and something possesses a function, at least on a historical account, because in certain key moments, the performance of it contributed to the reproductive success of its bearers. But if there are cases in which our mechanisms for belief production are functioning properly when they produce false beliefs, this is going to produce a problem for the claim that the only function of these mechanisms is to produce true beliefs. Um, and this is very rough and ready because I want to get onto the main thesis, but the kinds of cases I have in mind are cases of beliefs produced by a self-enhancement bias, partiality bias, which is different docetic treatment of one's friends over strangers, and self-deception. And I think that such cases, whatever the mechanisms involved are, show that um, what's responsible for our belief production, those mechanisms aren't solely geared in all cases towards truth. And I think that these cases represent a large set of beliefs held by ordinary people, which exhibit biases which aren't truth-directed, and so demonstrate that we need to recognise another function proper to our mechanisms of belief production, which can accommodate these kinds of things. <coughs> so, I'm going to suggest that it's the function of producing beliefs which have the role of being useful in self-organisation. It's a bit clumsy, but um, hopefully it will be clear what I mean. So I'm going to just call these organising beliefs, and the, these are the kinds of things I have in mind. So beliefs which facilitate self-organisation, maintain esteem, avoid psychological damage, deal with intellectual frailties which might encourage one to depart from the standard of belief, and so on. And we're going to say that these beliefs don't have their utility in virtue of being an approximation to truth, but rather in their assisting the effective functioning of the believer. And it's useful here, Millikan again, to appeal to Millikan's notion of normal, note of capitalization, and that's used to designate a normative historical, not a statistical sense of normality. So for example, sperm normally, capital N, but not normally, statistically, fertilise over, but as Millikan notes, most never find an ovum and have to call it quits. So I want to say that the mechanisms which give rise to beliefs resulting from dosastic biases do so in circumstances abnormal for the production of true beliefs, so circumstances abnormal for the production of beliefs in line with 
their first proper function. And the story might be that perhaps these would be cases of high stakes where true beliefs would be psychologically damaging, so I'm going to leave the details of that to another day, but that's the rough and ready model. So, call the production of true beliefs proper function one, and the production of organising beliefs in the sense just specified, proper function two. So what this section was supposed to do is give some examples of beliefs which are usually false, which are, but which are nevertheless produced by mechanisms functioning as they ought to be functioning. And that's going to be important later in my explanation of the intuitive pool of explanations which cite sui generis epistemic properties and norms, or which at the very least fail to note the reductive base of epistemic normativity. Okay, uh, so this is going to be the phenomenon that I'm seeking to explain with this kind of account. So I'm going to understand epistemic normativity to pick out the conjunction of two claims. So first is that belief has truth as its standard of correctness. And the second one is that there are epistemic norms which govern belief. And I think that we can explain these two claims by appeal both to proper function one and to proper function two. And insofar as we explain it by appeal to proper function two, an outcome of my account is at least some of our beliefs about epistemic normativity are false. So I'll start with the standard of correctness, which is taken to be something like this, a belief is correct, if and only if it's true. And correct here is supposed to mean something distinct from true, so while other cognitive states can have contents which are true or false, truth and falsehood are a dimension of assessment of beliefs as opposed to many other psychological states or dispositions. So I could have an imagining which has a true content, doesn't make it a correct imagining, but a belief with a true content makes it a correct belief. So it's correct is thought to be a normative notion which attaches not to the proposition believed but to the attitude or act of believing. Um, but I'm going to follow um, Krista Bickvist and Andy Hattin Gaddy in understanding belief standard of correctness as non-normative and as they say correctly I think understanding correctness in this way is in line with common usage. So they say Judging that fine is correct is compatible with judging that one ought not to fine. Judging that fine is incorrect is compatible with judging that one ought to fine. When it is a fact that fine meets a certain standard, there's always a further question whether the standard ought to be met. In some cases, it ought to, and in others, it ought not to, or it's not the case that it ought to. Okay. So, some, this is a really simple point, but it's going to be really important. So, some standards generate an ought, some standards don't generate an ought. So, and this is their example, judging that driving as a woman in Saudi Arabia contravenes conventional standards is not to think a woman in Saudi Arabia ought not to drive. Now in this case we have a standard which many people wouldn't endorse, and so it's maybe easier to see the difference between a standard being in place and there being something normative about that standard. But in other cases the difference between the standard and there being something stronger in play might be obscured by our already endorsing that standard. So it's in this sense of standard that I'm going to give an explanation of the standard of correctness for belief. Now you might just think I'm cheating, and um, if you Google the word inert, you get that picture of a kitten, that's why it's on the slide. <coughs> so you might think this move is dialectically inert because I'm arguing against philosophers who take epistemic normativity to involve something stronger than biological normativity, including those who take it to involve sui generis epistemic properties and norms. And here, I say that I'm going to understand belief standard of correctness in a relatively thin way as not involving any claims about what one ought to believe. And then later I argue that this standard is given by belief's biological heritage and explain away the appearance of other readings. So what I'm up to is endorsing Vickvist and Hattie and Gaddy in a preemptive spirit. So those who think that standards of correctness necessarily entail there being something normative about that standard will already take my account to be wrong-headed. So it's important to note that there's a difference between a standard being in place and there being something normative about that standard which gets you involved. So I'm going to explain for the case of belief why we're prone to think that there is a special or at least non-biological normativity attached to the standard of belief. So epistemic norms, which was EN2, the second conjunct of epistemic normativity. So it's thought that there are epistemic norms which govern belief formation for example, those of evidence, a belief is correct if it rests upon sufficient evidence, rationality, a belief is correct if and only if it's rational, and so on. And these norms are taken to govern only belief, so it's generally inappropriate to say of my imaginings or supposings that they are rational, irrational, justified, unjustified, and so on. And these 
the state norms are also usually characterised as categorical as opposed to hypothetical, so our obligations to comply with them are those to which the practical benefits of beliefs are not relevant. They are obligations that arise from a purely impartial and disinterested perspective. So these are kind of unhelpful labels, um, and I will change them in line with Kathy's actually given me better labels, but I'd already read the slides. So. I'm going to call them strong and weak epistemic normativity, but you might much more helpfully think of them as uh, irreducible and reducible epistemic normativity, because that's what I mean. Okay, so, so my strategy is to explain EN1 and EN2 in biological terms and explain away the intuitive force of these theses understood as involving epistemic as opposed to biological normativity. And the first explanatory task will be discharged by a proper function 1, and the second by a proper function 2. So, again, belief has a standard of correctness according to which true beliefs are correct and false beliefs are incorrect, or belief is correct if no belief is true, and there are epistemic norms which govern belief. So I think that there are two kinds of explanation, at least two kinds of explanation, for these two claims. One which is going to cite epistemic properties and norms, which are irreducible, and my favourite biological reductivist explanation. So I refer to the normativity given by these two explanations as strong epistemic normativity and weak epistemic normativity. Okay, so I think this is the easier bit to explain a weaker epistemic normativity by appeal to function. So I've said that the biological function of producing true beliefs is one of the functions of our mechanisms for belief production, and that function lays down a standard from which token beliefs can deviate. And I think that this provides the only sense in which true beliefs are correct and false beliefs are incorrect. So in the same way that there's a standard from which a chameleon skin pattern can deviate, which is determined by the environment which makes it a correct or an incorrect skin pattern. So when a belief is true, the mechanisms which produced it have performed their function, and when a belief is false, the mechanisms have failed to perform their function, or worse, have malfunctioned. And it's in this sense only that belief has a standard of correctness. So beliefs produced by mechanisms functioning to produce true beliefs have the derived proper function of being true. And now we might say, what does that say about what the individual believer must do at the agent level? Um, and it's really important, it's in bold. So absolutely nothing, and um, this is from Papineau. So it's a vulgar and indeed dangerous error to infer from the premise that X has been biologically designed to do Y, that in some sense X ought to do Y. So our mechanisms of belief production being designed to produce true beliefs doesn't mean that they ought to, and nor does it mean that we, at the agent level, ought to facilitate the meeting of this standard. And this is important because our epistemic practice at least suggests that we do feel obligations in this area, and yet if the standard of correctness for belief is grounded in something which doesn't generate obligations, what are we to say of our epistemic practice? So my view is that our epistemic practice is not tracking any real obligation on us to believe truly, rather the derived biological function of many of our beliefs is to be true, and what our epistemic practice does is facilitate the meeting of that biologically grounded standard. Okay. So my explanation of EN2 is sort of less of an explanation and more of a denial of the phenomenon, and then later an explanation of why we make the mistake of thinking that there really are these epistemic norms which prescribe what we ought to believe. So I think that there just aren't any epistemic norms in any strong sense, but there are just dosastic strategies we can follow which facilitate the meeting of belief standard of correctness. And these dosastic strategies are mischaracterized as categorical epistemic norms which bind our practice. So the kinds of dosastic strategies I have in mind are those like treat normal perceptual experience as prima facie or critical, honor logical inferences, employ the inductive methods in empirical inquiry, and I think that these are strategies which just facilitate successful navigation of the world and prediction of the future course of experience. So, I should pause here to note my use of categorical in the paper, which is going to be important <coughs> for getting clear about the commitments of my view, or at least getting clear about what it is that I'm denying. So I said earlier in my explication of epistemic normativity that epistemic norms have been taken to be categorical, and I cashed out what that means in terms of independence from agents, goals, or desires. But I think a little more is needed because categor categoricity has been understood in at least at long two dimensions, and my view requires them to be kept separate. So here are two dimensions of categoricity which I picked up. 
from reading Kant for the first time in a long time. So Kant says that, uh, Kant defines categoricity in these two ways, but they're, they're kind of rubbed together. So one way of understanding it is independence from the goals or desires of agents, <coughs> which the rule or the norm binds, and this is contrasted with hypothetical. So the categorical imperative would be that which represented an action as necessary of itself without reference to another end, that is, as objectively necessary. But then there's this other dimension of categoricity, which is the binding of all rational agents, and Kant speaks of categorical imperatives governing all subjects who are practically determinable by reason. So my view is one which understands so-called epistemic norms as dosastic strategies which facilitate the meeting of belief standard of correctness. And such strategies, when formulated as rules, are taken by us to be categorical ones. Um, and what we identify as epistemic norms are good dosastic strategies regardless of the interests of agents, but they don't generate any non hypothetical rules. So a strategy like believe in line with perceptual experience is one which will facilitate believing in line with belief standard of correctness, even if I have no desire to have true beliefs. Um, but these strategies are not categorical in the sense of applying to all rational agents or all believers, and that's because not all beliefs will have truth as their standard of correctness, because of course I've got this motivational account of belief in the background, and so I don't get the correctness stuff out of um, belief. It doesn't come that cheap. So one way of thinking about the position that I'm trying to develop is to note the ways in which I depart from my opponents, and I can think of at least three ways. So I disagree with the proponent of irreducible epistemic normativity on three grounds. So I disagree that there are irreducible epistemic norms, I disagree with the global extension of those norms, and I disagree with the local extension of those norms. So I'll take each point in turn. And they kind of, they get harder to defend as I go on, so this is the, the simpler one. So the irreducibility point, I don't think there are any irreducible epistemic properties or norms. So my explanation of the standard of correctness is one which appeals to proper function, um, the proper function one of our mechanisms for belief production, and this proper function provides a sense in which it's true that truth is the standard of correctness for beliefs. And the explanation of EN2 goes via an appeal to the biological standard and notes that there are dosastic strategies which facilitate its being met. So there are no epistemic norms, but just strategies one can adopt, which make it more likely that one will have true beliefs, beliefs which are successful in performing their derived proper function of being true. But my opponent, I take it, will take belief standard of correctness to be epistemic in kind, and takes there to be categorical epistemic norms which bind our dosastic practice and generate claims about how we ought to believe. So global extension. So I think that the biologically grounded standard of correctness and the strategies which facilitate its being met are categorical insofar as they uh, apply and hold irrespective of our desires or activities. But they're not categorical in the sense of holding for everyone. So they're not categorical in the sense of um, holding for all believers. So it's not the case, for example, that swamp man's beliefs are correct and true. So for those unfamiliar, Swamp Man is Davidson's invention and the story goes like this. So Davidson's struck by lightning, his body is reduced to its elements and out of a nearby swamp, a molecule for molecule replica of Davidson spontaneously coalesces. And then we wonder about whether this creature has beliefs and if so, how their contents gets fixed and whether this creature's heart has a function and so on. So on my account, Swamp Man's beliefs because them do not have truth as a standard of correctness. And if that's right, Strategies like believe in line with perceptual experience are not going to be ones which facilitate meeting that standard of correctness for swamp man's beliefs, if there is one. That's up for grabs. So for a rational creature with a different biological history, my opponent will take belief standard of correctness and epistemic norms to apply to them. From my account, whether this creature's beliefs are correct when true, and so whether certain dosastic strategies um, will facilitate meeting that standard is an empirical question, in particular one which turns on their biology or other relevant historical factors. Okay. So Swamp Man doesn't have a biological history and so it's going to just be an open question about whether his beliefs, if he has them, are correct or true. And if you're unhappy with the Swamp Man example because you think Swamp Man can't have beliefs, then just think of um, an alien being whose history is unknown. Um, we don't know, we can't yet pronounce whether their beliefs are correct or true on my view. So third, and most controversially, I think, I disagree with uh, the opponent about the local extension of EN1 and EN2. So I'm seeking to explain 
EN1 and EN2 for the large subset of our beliefs which are produced by mechanisms performing proper function 1, the production of true beliefs. But as I said earlier, it would be remiss of us not to note that many of our beliefs are produced by mechanisms seeking to produce organising beliefs whose usefulness is not in their being approximately true, but in facilitating the effective functioning of the believer. And those beliefs which are produced by mechanisms functioning to produce organising beliefs do not come under the standard of truth for belief. And this means that some false beliefs are correct insofar as they're the result of mechanisms functioning properly in line with proper function 2, and some false beliefs are incorrect insofar as they are the result of mechanisms functioning improperly or in abnormal conditions in line with proper function 1. And this is just, I think, a straightforward consequence of locating the correctness of belief in the proper function of the mechanisms which produce them. So not only do EN1 and EN2 not apply to all believers, I also think that they don't apply to all of the beliefs of humans. So, given my explanation of the sense in which I think EN1 and EN2 are true, I noted how my view departs from <coughs> proponents of strong epistemic normativity. But I think this is probably an explanation which will strike most people as unintuitive. And so I think it falls upon me to give consideration to how we think about the claims in EM1 and EM2, identify any mistakes we make in our epistemic discourse, and explain why we make those mistakes. Okay, so the account of mis the mistake um, we offer is going to depend on exactly what the mistakes in our epistemic discourse are. And I think that there are broadly two options. So one way of understanding what we're up to in epistemic discourse is, is Characterising this discourse as one which posits sui generis, irreducible epistemic normativity. And the other kind of weaker way is just to understand this discourse as one which is incomplete. So as one which doesn't recognise the reductive base of epistemic normativity. So I'll just consider briefly these characterisations in turn and then I'll offer an account which can explain why we make either or both of these mistakes. So whatever it is that our epistemic discourse involves, I think that I can explain away the mistakes that we make in it. So, does our epistemic discourse involve the positive of sui generis, irreducible epistemic properties and norms? So I've given an account of EN1 and EN2 which pursues exactly these kinds of properties and norms. And given that I deny that they exist, if our epistemic practice is one which cites such properties and norms, then I ought to offer an account of where we mistakenly believe them to exist. So, when people say things like it's correct to believe that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon because it's true, do they really take themselves to be appealing to a special kind of normativity? So I'm not convinced, but here are a couple of things you might say in favour of this interpretation of what we're up to. So those philosophers engaged in conceptual analysis of belief, who do take belief to be subject to an epistemic standard, which is not reducible to a biological one, might support this characterisation of our epistemic discourse. Um, because if their analysis of the concept of belief is correct, this is supposed to map onto common practice. Then you might also think about people who take the practice of inquiry very seriously, people who are really driven to find truths. They might be people who are correctly characterised as feeling strong epistemic obligations in line with the characterisation of epistemic discourse as involving appeal to sui generis properties and norms. But I think I'm more attracted to this kind of characterisation of what we're up to. So perhaps our discourse doesn't involve the positing of these special irreducible epistemic properties, but rather just fails to reflect the truth about the reducible base of belief standard of correctness and the dosastic strategies which facilitate its being there. So when we say things like it's correct to believe that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon because it's true, we're not doing anything really heavy in citing these epistemic properties. We're just failing to recognise that the only sense in which it's true that believing this would be correct um, i.e. that doing so would be to believe in line with beliefs biologically grounded standard of correctness. But it's important to note that this, if this is the right characterisation of the error inherent in epistemic discourse, it's not reflecting the reductive base, this isn't merely a mistake of quantity, so it's not just that we're ignorant of the reductive base, because we also make the mistake of thinking that belief standard of correctness, however it's grounded, generates claims about how we ought to believe. And I think that's something that... Um, both characterizations of epistemic discourse are going to allow, and that's something that I want to deny. So I think that that's an error. So our mechanisms of belief production having the biological function of producing true beliefs tells us nothing about how we ought to behave as believers. 
So even if our epistemic discourse doesn't commit us to sui generis epistemic properties, at the very least it commits us, it seems to me, to ought claims about what we ought to believe, or to thinking that we have reasons to believe truly, regardless of our interests. Okay, so I, I think that we don't need to resolve exactly what we take ourselves to be committed to in epistemic discourse. Um, I think that what I'm going to say with appropriate amendments can explain either of these characterizations, but I think that at least one of the accounts is going to capture roughly what we're up to. Okay. So there are two ways in which our epistemic discourse might be in error. So the first is to posit this sui generis epistemic normativity, and the second is to just fail to acknowledge the biological nature of what we identify as epistemic normativity. But both kinds of characterizations are going to include the claim that belief standard of correctness and the norms which guide our meeting it are prescriptive and categorical. Now, some people at this point might be on board and might see that there really is an explanatory burden here, that the epistemic discourse we engage in places on a biological account, but others might just think I'm over-intellectualising our discourse and might say that there is no such burden. And if that's right, then I don't have any argument with them, sort of sympathetic to that position sometimes, but here I answer those who think that in giving a biological account of epistemic normativity, I leave something. So the strategy is to give a biological explanation of where we make these mistakes by appealing to the claim that doing so is adaptive. So call those beliefs which are part of our epistemic discourse strong epistemic beliefs. So believe that the is correct, or you ought to believe in line with the evidence. Now the first kind of claim can be true in a weak sense, but not in any stronger sense. Um, and the second kind of claim is always false, uh, taken as indicating any kind of categorical imperative. So, I'm going to make an evolutionary debunking argument for these beliefs. So, an evolutionary debunking argument is one which seeks to undermine the justification of a set of evaluative beliefs by appealing to their evolutionary origins. So, it will cite a non truth tracking process for the production of those beliefs, which is um, supposed to be an undermining defeater for them. So, I think we can give an evolutionary debunking argument for strong epistemic beliefs by filling in Guy Cahane's basic structure of such arguments. So he says there's a causal premise, there's an epistemic premise, and then you get your conclusion. So the causal premise is that the existence of strong epistemic beliefs is explained by the adaptiveness of such beliefs. The epistemic premise is that strong epistemic beliefs are produced by an off-track process by mechanisms functioning to produce organising beliefs, and therefore strong epistemic beliefs are unjustified. Now, Cahane's structure is enthemomatic as it stands, so for validity it's going to require an additional premise to the effect that if a belief is produced by an off-track process, then it's unjustified. And I think that the motivation for this additional premise will be given in my expl explication of the epistemic premise in a minute. And I think this argument shows not only that the target beliefs are unjustified, but it also gives us an explanation of why we have such beliefs, even though, as I've suggested, they're false or at least incomplete. So my view is that wherever we identify the error in epistemic discourse, many of our beliefs therein are false. Um, those beliefs about sui generis, irreducible epistemic properties and norms express propositions which are uniformly false. And those beliefs which fail to reflect the source of epistemic normativity as biological are at the very least incomplete. And an explanation can be given for why we have such beliefs by appeal to the biological usefulness of them. So I think that our having beliefs which posit irreducible normativity or merely beliefs which fail to reflect the biological grounds for epistemic normativity help, faci uh, yeah, help facilitate the meeting of this biologically grounded standard of correctness. So I think that strong epistemic beliefs are produced by mechanisms functioning to produce organising beliefs which are useful not as an approximation to truth, but rather with respect to facilitating the effective self-organisation of the believer. So our feeling it appropriate to hold our beliefs to epistemic norms, to standards of production, is a way of making it more likely that our beliefs have true contents. And having true beliefs, so having beliefs which reflect the biological nature of epistemic normativity, I think would result in fewer true beliefs than we would have were we to have false beliefs about epistemic normativity, as I think that we do. So if we recognise that the only normativity attaching to our belief forming and ascribing practices was normativity rooted in biology, we might be less inclined to form beliefs in accordance with what we identify as epistemic norms, so dosastic strategies which facilitate the meeting of beliefs biologically grounded standard of correctness. So now I should say something about dosastic control. 
So what I've said so far assumes that we can exercise some kind of control over our beliefs, but I think that this is a harmless assumption since it's one we find in our very practice of epistemic evaluation. So though epistemic evaluation does function to mark whether a believer meets some epistemic standard, it's also evaluation that has directive or instructive import. And the appropriateness of epistemic evaluation, and this is Kate Northey's claim, is explained in part by our being able to exercise some kind of dosastic control. And our epistemic evaluation presupposes that we can do this. So I agree with most philosophers that we can't exercise any direct control over our belief formation, but my account of the usefulness of false beliefs about epistemic normativity doesn't require the truth of dosastic voluntarism. It just requires something much more modest, that we can exercise dosastic control in some sense. And how it is that we do so is um, a huge debate that I don't know much about, um, so I'm not going to engage fully with that issue. But what I want to say is that whichever account of dosastic control we prefer, I think that um, the two that I consider at least are congenial to what I want to say about the usefulness of our false beliefs about strong epistemic relativity. So, how do we exercise dosastic control? I'll just give you two accounts that Kate considers in her paper. So there's the immediate causal impact account, which says that what it is for a believer to exercise dosastic control is for her to be caused to regulate her beliefs in some particular circumstances by her judgments regarding how she ought to regulate her beliefs in those particular circumstances. And then Kate's preferred account, the disposition regulation account, says that a believer's judgments about how she ought to believe do not directly impact her practice, but rather shape her cognitive character. They thus have a deferred impact on her belief forming practices, by bringing the way in which she believes closer in line with her conception of the relevant epistemic ideal. So, whichever of these accounts is correct, I think that we can see how judgments of epistemic evaluation can impact the regulation of our beliefs. And this occurs either directly via those judgments, as with the immediate causal impact account, or indirectly via those judgments shaping our cognitive characters, as with the disposition regulation. So, I have this analogy which I think is helpful to reproduction. So we compare the case of belief forming practices to our reproductive practices. So with respect to biology, there's a sense in which we're supposed to reproduce our kind, so um, there's this biological standard. And we recognize this, but many of us choose not to reproduce, so we don't allow the standard laid down by biology here to motivate us inescapably to act in accordance with it. And my view is that if we took there to be kind of sui generis irreducible categorical procreation norms generated from special kind of normativity, we might be less inclined to choose not to act in accordance with the standards laid down by biology for this activity. But even though we don't, we don't take there to be these weird norms, of course, um, there is, there seems to be, so we're not directly motivated to reproduce our kind, but there is a mechanism in place which kind of helps facilitate our following that biological so we might expect to find some mechanism in place in the epistemic case to try to get us to follow the standards for belief laid down by biology. And I think that there is such a mechanism, and I think that mechanism is our epistemic discourse. So biology has laid down truth as a standard of correctness for belief, so um, in circumstances normal for the performance of proper function one, we should get true beliefs, and there are dosastic practices which facilitate our meeting that standard. And I think that if we had true beliefs about the source of epistemic normativity as being reducible, we might, as with the reproduction case, be less inclined to form beliefs in line with what's prescribed by our epistemic discourse. So recognising that there are standards laid down by biology with respect to belief does not in any way secure, secure conforming to those standards. And if we had true beliefs about the nature of epistemic normativity, we might well be less motivated to form beliefs in epistemically ideal ways, so far as this is psychologically possible, and also be less disposed to judge the epistemic behaviour of others. So knowing that the standards and norms for some activity are only biological in kind might allow, allow for some reflective distance from it, so you might feel less motivated to adhere to some standard if that standard is merely biological. So I think that having beliefs of the wrong strength with respect to the normativity involved in belief makes it psychologically more difficult not to engage in the kinds of behaviours and practices that our epistemic discourse commits us to. So having these false beliefs encourages us to exercise dosastic control in line with what we take to be epistemic standards and norms. Now, if you don't find this persuasive, just sort of turn things over. So our epistemic discourse is one which fails to reflect the nature of epistemic normativity, right? We don't think of it in biological terms. 
And so there really is a question here to be asked about why this is the case. Um, if it's right that epistemic normativity is, is only biologically defined. So that's the kind of question that I'm trying to answer here. Okay. So the causal premise alone of the evolutionary debunking argument doesn't show that our strong epistemic beliefs are unjustified, because even if such beliefs are adaptive, that doesn't demonstrate that there's only biologically grounded epistemic normativity and that its stronger counterpart is illusory. So we can't go from an explanation of beliefs about epistemic normativity as adaptive to the claim that those beliefs are unjustified. So they might be adaptive just because they're responsive to genuine sui generis epistemic normativity, which attaches only to belief. But my explanation for weak epistemic normativity does speak against the truth of a stronger reading of EN1 and EN2, because the claims of weak epistemic normativity and strong epistemic normativity are contradictory. So to see this, Let's see how far we can get if we suppose for a moment that they're both true. So here are the opposing explanations of belief standard of correctness. So for me, I think that it's reducible to biology, but my opponent might say that it's explained by epistemic normativity or the very concept of belief. And this would introduce overdetermination, I think, which is presumably best avoided. Um, but that's, that's not uh, conclusive. What's more worrying is the opposing explanations of epistemic norms, because on my view there aren't any. There are just osastic strategies which we identify as epistemic norms. But my opponent's going to take there to be these norms, and given these contradictory existence claims, we can't both be right. So if I'm right, we don't actually need the epistemic premise of the evolutionary debunking argument, because the falsity of strong epistemic normativity follows from the truth of the biological account of epistemic normativity. And the causal premise just gives us an explanation for why we have strong epistemic beliefs, even though they're false. But perhaps you're not convinced, and so I should say more. So let's say that we need a further argument for the claim that the causal story for the existence of these beliefs is an off-track one, so it's one which doesn't track truth. So my claim is that conditions for the performance of proper function 2 are abnormal in a Millicanian way, conditions for the performance of proper function 1. So the performance of function 2 does not track the truth. And my explanation for why we have beliefs in line with strong epistemic normativity, even though they're false, is that they're the products of our mechanisms for belief production, performing the function of producing organising beliefs. And this means that the process by which we come to have these beliefs is a process which is off track with the resulting beliefs being justified. So I think that strong epistemic beliefs are produced in line with the performance of the proper function of producing organising beliefs. And the kinds of beliefs these mechanisms produce are those which are useful, but also usually false. And at the very least, this gets us to claim that our strong epistemic beliefs are unjustified. So they're produced by mechanisms which aren't tracking truth, and the products of these mechanisms in other cases are usually false. And if this is right, we've got an additional reason for thinking that not only are strong epistemic beliefs unjustified, but they're also false. And the additional reason which we get from my account of the production of these beliefs is that the mechanisms which produce them are just not interested in truth. It's not something which plays a role in the production of the beliefs. So if beliefs about epistemic normativity at this stronger uh, strength were true, this would be an accidental feature of them. And so I think this is a reason to think that they're not merely unjustified, but also false. And perhaps considerations of theoretical parsimony also go in my favour here. So why suppose that the true value of these beliefs differs from all other beliefs produced in line with this function? To think this, you need a reason to think that these beliefs buck the trend. But I think we don't have any reason to think that they do. Um, and so the claim that these beliefs are false rather than merely unjustified starts to look more plausible. So this is what I've done. So given a biological reductivist account of epistemic normativity, and that account explains the sense in which it's true that belief is subject to a standard of correctness, and deny the existence of epistemic norms in favour of dosastic strategies prescribed by our epistemic discourse, which facilitate the meeting of beliefs biologically grounded standard of correctness. And I gave a debunking argument to explain away the appearance of strong epistemic normativity which appeal to the claim that beliefs about epistemic normativity are false but useful, and are the outcome of a non-truth tracking 